this video is going to be for those who are looking to move into their next step. They've decided that they want their career to be in healthcare administration, but they're like, okay, what now? So with all that being said, Hey, I'm Erin Danae and welcome back to my corner of the internet. And in this video, I want to talk about my four step plan on how to work your way into getting a job in healthcare administration and not just getting a job, but nailing down, figuring out what your next step is going to be. So in my previous content, it was geared towards college students, um, students in general, people just looking for career options, looking for major college major options. And it was coming from the perspective of this is why you should choose healthcare administration or, you know, this is what you need to think about. This is what you need to consider if you want to potentially switch your major and pivot your career into health, into the healthcare administration field. And now I think <laughs> I've made a lot of content in that. And of course, if there are any other questions in that regard, I'd be more than happy to return to that topic and dive deeper, dig deeper into whatever people are curious about. But in this video, I really want to start giving tips, practical advice on how to create a career in healthcare administration. So this is really for the person who has decided, who has you know, change the major, committed to the career, committed to the industry, um, and is now looking for advice on what they need to do next, right? They need to figure out, okay, what, okay, healthcare administration is kind of, it's kind of broad, right? It's kind of vague. It's a bit ambiguous, right? What about that and, and what all that goes into it? am I specifically going to do? Am I specifically going to apply for when I'm looking for jobs, right? How could I figure that out? Um, I think that this step is something that a lot of people skip over. And I don't know if it's a misconception, if it's a misunderstanding, if they're just unaware and just undereducated on this part of the process. Um, but I see a lot of people like on my TikTok or maybe even Instagram, you know, they'll comment, they'll DM me and it's like, well, I just graduated and I can't find a job or, or, you know, I'm looking for a job, but I can't get one. Um, or I don't know what to, I don't know what jobs to even look for. I don't know what jobs to even apply to. Right. And this is the thing again about healthcare administration. That's tricky is that think of it as a business degree, but for healthcare, right? Business degrees are very broad, right? You don't see job titles like, we need a businessman. There is no job title like that. It's like, maybe, you're, maybe you apply to a consulting job. Maybe you apply to run a business. Maybe you become an entrepreneur, right? It's very flexible, um, you know, just depending upon your personal goals. And I feel that healthcare administration is very similar to that, but just within the realm of healthcare. Um, healthcare is not just hospitals. It's not just, you know, a doctor's office. Healthcare, the healthcare industry in the United States of America encompasses so many different players, so many different sectors, so many different organizations and companies and associations and collaboratives. And there's a lot that actually goes into it. And so for those of you who are new to this industry, new to this career choice, I would highly recommend checking out my Substack linked down below in the description box because I am walking through a series of, of you know, understanding the industry from very high level view so that you can get a good start at developing that foundational knowledge of the industry that you're going to need um, when you're navigating this and when you're trying to figure out where you want to work and what kind of work you want to do, there are different factors and variables to consider. So I would consider my sub stack because it's a great place to start very basic type of, you know, information about the industry. It's not super convoluted. It's not super, um, you know, complex. And, and I try to write it in a way that's easy for anyone to understand. And so 
Let me go over my four step plan really quickly. And I created this plan because of this digital product that I put together. Um, it was just on my heart and on my mind. And I was like, people need help <laughs> to really figure all of the things out. And so I created this digital guide for early careerists and it could be for students as well who are looking to plan their career now to really take the time, walk through each of these steps and figure out what career could be for them and what career could be could be best aligned with what they want in life, period. So the four steps in this plan are step number one, reflect. Step number two is to research, gather information, get all the tea, get all the intel. Uh, step number three is to plan because now you're going to actually make decisions, but they're going to be informed based on your reflection and based on the research and information that you gather. And then step number four is going to be apply. And apply can mean a lot of things, right? In this context, I mean, more literally, I meant applying to jobs, but also like applying the information that you learned, applying any advice that was given to you, applying the tips, applying the new knowledge to all these scenarios, all these, you know, future interactions that you could see yourself walking into. And so I mean apply specifically, but also in a broader sense. So those are the four steps in the plan. In this video, I would like to go over step number one, which is going to be reflect. Now, reflecting is important because it helps you understand yourself on a deeper level. And in this digital product guide, I do have specific questions that you can walk through and ask yourself, but you can also just do a general reflection where you say, okay, look, let me just sit and think about, you know, what do I see for myself in this career? Um, what kind of work-life balance do I want? What kind of work do I want to be able to do? And a large part of this reflection is to identify your preferred work activities, right? Because you're not always going to be able to do the work activities that you most like. Most of the time, you want to find a job where majority of it is like, I really enjoy this. And then maybe there are a couple of things that you're like, if I never do this again, I would be fine with that. But since I have to do it, it's okay. I can live with this. So identifying your preferred work activities is very important because most of the time, especially if you're new to just analyzing the job market market and identifying job positions to apply to, this is a really great way to very quickly narrow down what you're looking for as an early careerist and as a student. Oftentimes, job titles, they kind of fluctuate. They move around and certain companies word their job titles in a specific way just so that it sounds better when someone is reading it, but really it's just this, right? So one example is like, one of my previous positions was member support specialist. Really, I was just an administrative assistant who sometimes had to call our members and call patients and, you know, send reminders and stuff like that. But they gave it a, a quote unquote fancier title so that it would sound better and it would fit the the vibe of the organization and of the company. And so that's why I say identifying your work activities, your preferred work activities first is much more valuable to you as an early careerist and as a student, because you can use that as kind of your North Star, as kind of your, your measuring stick, you know, against all of these job positions that you may be reviewing and looking at right now, maybe if you're applying to jobs now or in the near future. So that's one of the components of the reflection piece is identifying those work activities. Looking at your past jobs and your current jobs, what were the things that you liked that you had to do in those jobs? And what were the things that you absolutely did not like in those past jobs? And what were the things that you were like, I don't have a preference. Maybe you don't have a preference on certain things. Or maybe... You're like, I would like to not do this, but if I have to, 
I can, it's not a deal breaker. That's the first component. The second component of this self-reflection piece is going to be identifying your skills and your strengths. And this is very important because these are the things that you're going to communicate through your a variety of application materials, whether it's your resume, your cover letter, maybe you're also submitting a portfolio or you know some kind of pitch deck. You want to be really, really clear on communicating what kind of a worker you are and what kind of a person you are. So are you more analytical? Are you detail oriented? Um, are you more, are you a good communicator or a bad communicator? Um, it, are you good in written communication or oral communication, right? Are you good with data and data analysis and using Excel and Tableau and Power BI and all of these things? What, what are your specialties? What are your skills? What makes you stand out from other people and other candidates? So not only does, you know, identifying your skills and your strong suits create a way for you to differentiate yourself from the pack, but it also is a concise and a succinct way to communicate exactly who you are to the recruiter and to the employer so that they can better assess whether or not you'd be a good fit for that team, for that position, and for the organization as a whole. So again, the first component is going to be identifying your preferred work activities because that will help you narrow down the kinds of jobs that you'll be looking for. And you can also use that to identify the job titles that you should be searching for. So sometimes for me, I would start with the preferred work activity that I wanted to. Let's say, for example, I wanted to do data analysis. And so I would look at jobs in healthcare that involved some level of data analysis. And then from there, if once I found a job that I was like, oh, this sounds like, a, like what I'm looking for, then I would take that job title, note it, write it down somewhere. Now I have at least one search term that I can use when I go back and look for jobs the next day and the next day and the next day. And as you find more positions that align with what you're actually looking for, then you can document those other job titles as well and kind of create a bank of search terms so that you know, you're not typing in random things or you, you're not feeling as though you're starting from scratch every single time you open LinkedIn job postings or every time you open Indeed.com, you don't feel like you don't know how to navigate the search engine part of that. So that's a tip right there. That's the first component. And then again, the second component is going to be identifying your skills and your strengths because you want to be able to effectively communicate who you are, and what you can do. Because those are the two most important things that really employers and recruiters want to know. Outside of that, they also want to know, okay, who are you? What can you do? And then thirdly, they want to know, what have you previously accomplished? And so that could be in a current job, in a past job. What did you actually do? What did you actually contribute? And so another way or approach you could take to reflecting is even reviewing your old resumes, reviewing your old cover letters, um, sprucing up your LinkedIn is also a great way to reflect on your past experiences. Um, and I, especially when I was applying to jobs actively, I would do that a lot. Just go back and read, okay, how was I describing myself in this job on LinkedIn, right? Or in this old resume, how was I describing this job and framing what I did and, and my accomplishments and how I contributed to the team and, you know, all of the projects I completed. Sometimes it's helpful to kind of go back and kind of jog your memory a little bit about that. This reflection piece is also very powerful because it helps to prepare you for that interview phase of applying to jobs or the job application process. Um, you know, the more that you are interacting with these materials and the more time you spend preparing them and reflecting and really honing in on identifying what you want and honing in on how to communicate that you're a good fit for what you want then the better that you're going to sound in your interview because you're going to come across as someone who has done the research, they've done the work, they've identified how they're a good fit and they can clearly communicate 
all of those different things. And that's extremely valuable in an interview. Many people think that, oh, I just need to submit this. And in an interview, I can knock it out of the park. But really, these days, you need to be a good candidate all the way around. So your resume needs to be good. Your cover letter needs to be good. Your portfolio needs to be good. Your pitch deck needs to be good. And your interview needs to be good as well. And those things should come across to the employer and to the recruiter as cohesive, as one piece. You don't want to be submitting an old resume because, you know, you're too lazy to revamp it or update it or make tweaks, make edits and make adjustments. And then you show up to the interview like, yeah, I've done X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. They're going to wonder why all of that material wasn't on your resume and or wasn't in your cover letter or wasn't in your portfolio and so you want to be sending one cohesive and comprehensive message through all these different components along the job application and interview process and that's another reason why reflecting and remembering on those things and almost kind of like practicing on your own time how you're going to communicate those different pieces all of that is very important and it works together to to really show and demonstrate your capability for this position. And so that's all I have for today's video. In the next video, I will go, I will be giving an overview for step two of the process, which is research. I have a couple of tools and approaches that you can use to really maximize on that next step and maximize the information that you can receive before moving forward to the other steps. And so I will see you guys in that next video. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, hope this helps. Bye.